Uh, good afternoon. This is Guillermo Sabatier, your host for our, the show today on Perspectives on Energy, and uh, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, I am, uh, once again, I am the Director of International Services for uh, the a Health and Safety Institute, Industrial Skills, and uh, I bid you welcome. So today we have, uh, I think it's the third installment on our NERC test prep uh in, in in the third in a series of NERC test prep exam review, uh, we'll, we'll go over a few of the uh, questions you're going to encounter on your NERC exam. Uh, today's topic covers uh, contingency analysis and reliability, and we'll talk about some of those scenarios you see on there. Maybe go over like 10, 12 questions, whatever we have time to do today in these like 26 minutes. But um, again, uh, thank you for tuning in, and uh, hopefully uh, this gives you a... a uh, I guess a teaser of what you would find if you took the uh, drawn out course offered by HSI Industrial Skills for the NERC RC certification uh, test prep. So we have the online test preparation portion that gets you through all the modules and gets you prepared. Uh, and then we also have a three and a half day instructor led uh, course that is like the final, final wrap up of everything. And usually these, uh, the questions you're, you're going to see today come from that class. So uh, you get a lot, a lot more questions in that in that actual course, but uh, this, of course, will give you an idea of what those exam questions look like. Uh, mind you, uh, we covered a few of them. Uh, the, the first session we did here, we talked about balancing and uh, AC equation and uh, things having to do with the uh, area control error and related topics. The second one was something a little bit different. It was more about transmission topics. And this one, we're going to, going to talk about uh, continuity analysis and more about um, topics having to do with, uh, with the, uh, some of the uh, distribution margins, right? And what happens in scenarios where you lose a line and how that overloads the, the, the other lines. So uh, without further ado, oh, by the way, also in our training, there is some simulation. So um, in another show, we'll pro hopefully have a, um, a demo of what we do with a, simula a simulation and how that demonstrates uh, how things actually run in the system. Uh, it's a um, power flow tool, which is very, very powerful and helping you visualize what, what's hap what happens and how to react and uh, give you give some better training, usually initial training, and of course, also continuing education on how to manage a power system. All right, so before further ado, let's go ahead and start on the first set of slides and we'll do the first question here. Okay, so here's an example, right? So transmission line C trips while carrying 800 megawatts. Line A has 275 megawatts of power flow. Line B has a flow of 400 at the time of the outage. So that's before the, you know, the other line trips. Line C has a loss line outage distribution factor of 0.25 and 0.1 related to the lines A and B respectively. So the reason the answer here is highlighted is 200 megawatts on A, 80 megawatts on B is simply you get those 800 megawatts, right? And simply multiply it times 0.25, which would be one fourth, right? I will say 800 megawatts, that will be 200 megawatts. And that's the impact, the loss of that line carrying 100 megawatts will have on line A. Now, what's the impact on line B? Well, line B, you read there, it says uh, one tenth, it's a 0.1 uh, line outage distribution factor, right? Related to line B. So one tenth of 80 megawatts, of 800 megawatts is 80 megawatts. So that is the effect that will have. And of course, it's a positive number. Notice that they give you answer C as a detractor, right? That's one of the things you have to remember in a lot of these questions is you have one or two really bad answers that are obvious, right? So what, what happens is on choice C, for example, it's if you're not paying attention, right? Especially if you think it's going, it, it's, it may, you may want to think that that it's you're losing 200 megawatts, but really it's not what it is, right? It's it's whenever you have three lines, for example, you lose one of the lines, and they're, and they're all on a parallel path. Um, that that flow will have to go. It's still flowing from a source to a load, and that flow still has to find its way on the remaining lines. So it, you know it stands to reason that whatever flow you didn't lose a load and you didn't lose a source, so it's still pushing that energy across there somehow. So it's going to find its way through those two lines 
potentially uh, out through some other lines in the interconnected system. So that's why uh, it's going to increase. And in this case, right, it's going to increase from 275 to 475 on line A, and there will be an increase of 80 megawatts, right, uh, from 400 to 480. And that will be the final, you know, uh, result here if they ask you that question. But what they're asking you here is what will be the impact on lines A and B due to the outage? So the impact is going to be uh, 208, 280 megawatts. If you notice also that uh, they're giving you like another weird answer there, like 475 and 480. Again, another detractor, and that's really, really wrong. They're, so they're making you assume that it's going to go up by by 400 or 400, which is, again, wrong. It's not going to be an even split at all because they have different impedances, right, based on how the flows are going. Clearly, line A has a lot lower impedance than line B. And I say that because there's a lot more flow. So usually uh, power lines will flow on a path of least resistance. So that the sense, again, line A is, it has less resistance or impedance than line B in this case. Uh, finally, and 480, 475 is a really bad answer by the tractor, meaning meaning that it'll they're gonna flow in the opposite directions. So that makes no sense at all. So, so again, just remember, uh, in this case, you know, you need to eliminate some of the answers. But here, it's it's a uh, A is the is meant to trick you. If you see, if you actually got the concepts correctly, and also if you read the question correctly, if you misread that question, you want to know what the final flow on those lines are. So if they ask, if the question here was what will be the resulting flow after the outage, then you might want to look at something else. But of course here, that answer is not even right anyway. So they, so at least in this case, they did you a favor by not giving you that information. Let me see, take a look again here. So it'll be, oh, actually, no, yeah, it, it, it it's definitely a detractor. So, uh, so in this case, you, it would look like, like an A. Right, if they had asked you that question, so like I said earlier, but either way, it's um, something to be, be very careful with. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, and if you could, please. All right, so a power flow study indicates that a transmission line will reach its emergency overload rating within the hour. Okay, you got some time. A parallel line is out of, is off for routine maintenance and can be placed in the service in 10 minutes. What is the first thing the operator should do, right? So, what are the things you're going to consider, right? So, uh, so th they gave you some 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 possible so, uh, action items here that, that you could jump to, right? But mind you, it's the line where we just emergency overload rating within the hour, which means right now it is not currently overloaded, right? It's it's going to be, and that which probably tells me that load is increasing, which means that it's. Uh, load isn't flat at this time of the day. If it were uh, you over the peak of the day and then load is kind of like uh, winding down, say it's after five o'clock, for example, where, where everybody now is, is quitting time and every day everybody goes home, then this may impact your decision, right? Because they say, well, maybe at this point, but of course you do a power flow, right? But so, and one of the things that you have to understand then uh, as when you're running system operations, uh, everything you do has to has to be run by a power flow. You, you don't want to do anything you don't want to be in a state which you haven't studied, right? Um, and part of that involves being able to understand where you're going to be and being being able to understand or predict what will be the next contingency. So if I if, if I show this line is going to be out of service, right, um, for the next hour or so, but it can be returned to service, right? The parallel line out for routine maintenance at this point, if you show it back in service, then that that overload magically goes away, of course, because it's a parallel line, similar to what we were talking about earlier. So if it takes 10 minutes to get this line back in service, uh, by the time you get everybody mobilized, and, and you know they, they usually call that a clear-up time, by the time you get every, everybody mobilized and make the calls and everything else, they can get it back in 10 minutes, then you should have everybody prepared to go ahead and put that line back in service within that time, right? So uh, so let's talk about why A, B, and C are the wrong answers in this case, and why D is the best answer. So, um, <laughs> so shed load of the downstream bus. Yeah, that'll certainly get rid of the overload, right? But uh, we don't want to shed load to keep from shedding load, right? You want to make sure that shedding load will be the last resort, and you would do you would shed load if you had to, right? That's usually if you're at a, already in an overloaded state, uh, or say for example something happened right now, and uh, 
you have a problem where, you know, contingency analysis tells you that this line right now will then overload and to begin a cascade and have a cascading outage, you, this could lead to a blackout. So, yes, that would be an event where you actually shed load. And if they told you that your line is currently overloaded and exceeding an IROR limit, then you would consider doing that. But you're not there. You're not even overloaded now. You're not even overloaded in, uh, until an hour from now. So you have time. So uh, there, A, is not an answer you want to do right now. Uh, redispatch generation. They didn't give you any choices with generation. Normally, that happens a lot, right? And you know, in, in utilities where they own both generation and transmission, oftentimes that happens. Uh, the problem with that is that redispatch and generation, you know, you have to consider where the generator is at. Uh, which one do you do you ramp up? Which one do you ramp down? And in this question, they gave you no such indication. They don't give you the scenario of where the generators are at. You'll see this in other questions, but it isn't on this one. So B isn't really an, uh, an adequate answer at this time. Now, the worst thing you could do in this case is open that line. <laughs> because in this case, that means that that power is still flowing. If you open that line, now it's going to force that power somewhere else. And more than likely, now you've caused a... A worse problem. So you're already down one line. You, then now you're going to get rid of another line, which of course is going to further aggravate uh, overload somewhere else. So in this case, right, we are going to do is initiate the restoration of that power in parallel line that's out for routine maintenance. That should take ten minutes. Um, normally, you don't want to wait to like you know ten minutes till to get the line you know back in service. You want to do it way ahead of time so you give yourself some kind of margin because, and that's usually what what uh, the uh, the industry does. In my experience, having gone through this sort of thing quite a lot, uh, usually the clear up time, they say it takes an hour. Sometimes it takes a little longer. Other times it's a lot quicker. I mean, I've, I've had that happen. But you want to give yourself like a cushion of time because in a lot of cases, right, you don't want to run up against that clock and actually have an overload. You got to remember, too, contingency analysis is looking at what ifs, what could happen. So that contingency analysis relies on state estimators. So state estimator tries to estimate your state uh, where you're going to be five minutes from now, 10 minutes from now. And, and so then when you grab, for example, your, your a snapshot of your system and you try and forecast where you're going to be an hour from now, you're estimating. So again, estimates are known to be off by, by, by some percentage points. I, I don't know how good you are, but you might end up having a problem with that estimate. You may be late, you may be early. So that's why you want to give yourself enough time. So that's why you would initiate restoration of the parallel line now, even if it only takes 10 minutes and you're going to, you're going to have an extra 50 minutes to even, you know, to contemplate, you know, what you did after the line comes back in service. So again, D is the best answer. All right. Let's go ahead and jump to the next question in this case. All right. You are a system operator and the load forecast is for an all-time summer peak load day. It's going to be hot, right? Now we have a lot of those right now. Generation and reactive resources will be tight. Okay. Which scheduled job would you allow to proceed? So in this particular case, right, uh, one of the things that we, we realize is that uh, what do you not need during such a day of high load, high heat, high demand, right? Every generator is, is, is maxed out. So, so capacitors are normally used to support voltage. So a capacitor bank is something you normally switch out at night. Uh, usually that's when you have excess of voltage. Voltage, So you don't need voltage support at night. In fact, you you, you want to keep voltage down at night because usually that's when everything is lightly loaded and voltage tends to creep up. So that's why A is not an answer. Relay testing, and I used to be a relay engineer myself out in the field. I can tell you that relay testing on a carrier on a heavily loaded 345 kb line is the last thing you want to do because uh, I mean most relay, most relay techs, most re relay engineers, PNC protection and control engineers are great, great, uh, great personnel. But you know accidents happen, and somebody could just simply bump a one of the cabinets, and you could pick up a relay. So you don't want to have anything being tested at the time, especially when you could accidentally trip something. So at this point, keep your hands in your pockets. No testing at this time. Time to catch up on paperwork. Uh, C. Uh, so B is not a good answer at this time. I mean, I would definitely hold off on relay testing. Uh, C, break, oh, especially if the line's hot. If, if the line's out of service and you got scheduled testing, then okay, fine. That's Then a scheduled service, the line's out. You can't do much damage. Uh, oh, we lost the slide. There we go. Now, uh, so 
but the lines in service carrying load uh, on a heavily loaded day, yeah, you don't want to do it. Number C, uh, letter C, breaker bushing cleaning on a generator breaker. Wow. So in this case, usually the, they clean breakers with distilled water, high pressure, high pressure hose. Uh, there's always that risk that you're going to, there's some contamination somewhere. You're going to have a flashover somehow and you could trip a generator. You could trip the, uh, you could trip, uh, you lose a lot of, uh, a lot of generation in that particular incident. So again, not a good thing because you're already you're already maxed out. You have a lot of your generating resources are, are online, and if you lose that, you may get close to a problem in this case. So uh, D. Finally, we arrive at D. Maintenance on a 735 kV shunt reactor. It's a really big one. So you're not going to be needing a shunt reactor in the middle of the day when you have in the summer on a heavily loaded day with every every single generating re resource online and trying to serve a lot of load. Uh, that's something you normally use at night on very on a very lightly loaded system. So in this case, you can afford to take a shunt reactor out of service because likely likelihood is you're not going to need it until maybe midnight or beyond that. So that's why D is a good answer in this case, the best answer. So that's it, D. All right, the next one, go ahead. Which condition is likely to lead to a potential voltage collapse? So remember we talked about uh, cap banks, right? Uh, okay, so in this case, uh, the answer here is insufficient dynamic reactor resources, right? So let's talk about what the way the other ones are wrong, right? So demand is higher than expected. That happens all the time, right? So uh, voltage collapse, I mean, that wouldn't necessarily lead to a voltage collapse, right? It's usually, it may, there may be a component, right, that got you there, but usually a, a lot more things have to go wrong, right? Uh, B, too many planned outages. No, I mean, that could have also gotten you there. But the fact of the matter is that usually it involves voltage collapse and then a lot a voltage collapse happens because you don't have anything to support the voltage. Right? Uh, D, lack of right-of-way maintenance is also not a good answer because at, at this point, it, it's, it's very far-fetched, right? In the, in the sense that you may have had an issue with vegetation, you may have had an issue with the problems, but if you had lack of right-of-way maintenance, that would more than likely indicate that you had a tree make contact with one of the lines. At that point, that would be more like a line fault, right? Uh, also, with budget management, uh, you have a lot of FAC standards that uh, have strict vegetation management rules. So right now, veg management is very well maintained when it comes to transmission systems, especially 100 kV and above. So the last one, right, C, which is the correct answer, Insufficient dynamic reactor resources, right? So dynamic reactor resources means uh, either a uh, the generation, for example, is a dynamic resource that can provide uh, reactive support, meaning they can they they can put bars into the system, they can absorb bars. So in a lot of cases, right, uh, usually the best resource you've got to help you uh, manage your voltage, of course, is the generators itself. So once you begin to lose, once your generator is already maxed out. And uh, you don't, they're giving you everything they can on those reactor resources. Uh, they can, they've done all they can. Uh, anything beyond that, the voltage begin, begins to decline. Now you're relying on your, 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 uh, your cap banks, your, your capacitors to give you, but that becomes a static resource. The problem with cap banks is that you know, those are very finite, right? And they are, Need to get them in service uh, early, but not too early, because if you wait too long, you, you reduce their their capability, uh, and that's the other issue. Now you, you got static bar compensators or synchronous condensers; those are a really great resource, right, to help you with your with your uh, dynamic uh, reactive uh, support. Problem is, though, you get to the point where if you run out of those as well, those are, those are a dynamic resource, right? You will have an issue supporting voltage. So, especially if the load right continues to climb. So in this case, right, the things that can really get you into that problem, into a voltage collapse, of course, would be insufficient dynamic reactive resources. All right, next question, please. Okay, uh, given the data on the image below, what would be the result if the load at bus B increased by 200 megawatts? So mind you, notice that everything's going from bus A to bus B. And so it's going from, I guess, left to right, right? And then there's lines one, two, three, and four. And of course, all these lines have different impedances. If you notice, uh, they are, except for the last line, three and four are the same impedance. Because you can tell that because they have a equal distribution factor. They have the same flow, even though the SOL limit is a little different, right? 260 and 280. 
So given the data image below, what would be the result of the load at bus speed increase 200 megawatts? So by 200 megawatt increase, it means uh, the distribution factors are on each of the lines, right? So 200 megawatts times 0.2. And really what you're doing is calculate, right? Uh, 200 megawatts times 0.3. So, point, so the math here is really quick. So a one-tenth of 200 megawatts would be 20 times 3 would be 60. So if you add... 240 plus 60, that puts you at 300. That right there will put you over the SOL, right? Now, if you did the same thing and you ran the math, so the SOL is 290, so the resulting flow on that line would be 300 megawatts. You're already over the SOL limit. That's why two is correct. Now, if you try and calculate the other lines, right? For example, distribution factor of 0.2, two tenths. So 200 megawatts, it's 40 megawatts. So you add 40 to 160 that'll be right at 200 megawatts. So you're not exceeding your SOL, you're, you're right at the SOL. So, so you're, not, you're not exceeding it yet. Uh, line three and four, for example, is both a quarter. So a quarter of 200 is 50. So that'd be 250 and 250. So they're well within the limits at that point. So that is not, not, not an answer. And of course, D is not the answer either. So really, in this case, line two would exceed the SOL. If line one would be at the at the SOL, then that would also be a good a good response. But you know, here they give you the the the, the, the most correct answer is line is uh, is answer B. Right? Hopefully that makes sense. This is a distribution factors right for uh, for each of the lines in this case. All right, let's go ahead and do the next question. A firm transaction is set to start at the top of the hour that will overload line Z by 10 megawatts above its identified SOL. System operating limit, right? Meaning it's 100%. Non-firm transactions are running and they have power transfer distribution factors of 0 0.2 on line Z. How much non-firm, well, here what they mean, how much non-firm uh, flow will have to be cut in order to stay within the SOL? Meaning that you got to cut back, you, know, you, you got to cut back somewhere on, 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 on all these transactions to reduce that line by 10 megawatts, right? So here, uh, the way you figure this out is multiply 10 times 0.2, you end up with 50. And that's how you would figure out that whole, uh, I'm sorry, you you divide you divide 10 by by uh, by 0.2, and that's how you get that 50 in this case. And that's how you get it. Okay, so you end up with 50. So you would have to cut 50 megawatts around that area just to alleviate the, the flow on that line by 10 megawatts. So that tells you what happens and with these like, power transfer distribution factors, right? When you actually schedule a line, you schedule you schedule flow on that line. You uh, the impact of that is so significant in the sense that you have to come. Uh, it, there, there there's some flow that's flowing through that line that you will cut, but it's also surrounding schedules that will also be impacted. So in this case, right, dividing uh, dividing ten by 0.2, you end up with fifty megawatts, in it. and so you have to cut fifty megawatts to give yourself ten megawatts of relief on that line. Pretty interesting. All right, let's do one more. Okay, so this is the, uh, oh, we can't see the formula here, but uh, it is the um, the uh, distribution factor for the generation shift factor, right, in this case. One thing you got to remember here, right, is that a transmission line AB has a system operating limit of 375 megawatts, and it's currently loaded at 450. So you've overloaded this line by about 75 megawatts, right? So with the below information, how would you redispatch to relieve the loading while maintaining system balance. So right now, uh, the way that works is you have, for example, generator A has a shift factor of negative 0 0.5 for line A to B. Generator B has a shift factor of positive 0 0.25 for line A and B, right? So they want you to, uh, it's basically uh, 70, 75 megawatts, right? So in this case, so what they want you to do is go ahead and uh, increase generation A by 100 megawatts and decrease generation B by 100 megawatts. And that'll give you the relief you need on that line to get you back down to that 375. So that answer C is the correct answer in this case. All right, and I think uh, we have time for one more. All right, a transmission line conductor is rated at 180 megawatts. The line side current transformer is rated at 160. And the bus is rated at 200 MVA. These are all MVA uh, units. What is the MVA limit of the transmission line? So in this case, 160, because it is the the weakest link. It is the lowest rated uh, element in that particular set of uh, components. So 160 is a current line side current transformer in this case. 
All right. I think that is all the time we have today for questions. Uh, the, again, there's more of these in our training and in our, in our online training that we have for the uh, online test prep course. And we have, of course, a lot of uh, really useful last minute training that we have on a three and a half day instructor led course. And those those usually that course you attend once you've completed all of the online modules and you've done all the exams and you have you're pretty much ready to kind of wrap things up. And then you're just about ready to go ahead and schedule your exam at that point. So uh, usually uh, the pass rate for this exam when you take it unaided is about 63, 65 percent. Uh, for us, we've seen in a pass rate between 80, 85 percent after taking our, our 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 online courses and our preparation programs. So definitely worth uh, actually investing in, in the time and the effort, and of course, the expense of going through this uh, online test prep program. It's uh, not to mention the fact that it's rather expensive to uh, sign up for the exam, uh, $700, I think it is. And then now, you know, you, so you, you only want to do that one time and not have to retake it again. So. But uh, so I definitely encourage you to go ahead and go to our website at hsi.com industrial skills. And I think uh, the, the, we're going to pull something up there that's a little longer. Um, it talks about the uh, the FIA from right there. It is. OK, so a little long. But if you go to the actual HSI solutions, you'll be able to drill down and find NERC uh, exam prep and they'll get you all the information you need. So uh, then again, if you're taking it, uh, lots of luck. If you have any other questions, just put it down in the comments or try and get to it as soon as we can. But definitely always, always encourage you to go ahead and join our program to get your NERG test prep training done so you can succeed and only have to take the exam one time. Okay. Uh, and then hopefully just keep up your certification with continuing education hours. Um, so anyway, thank you again for joining us. And I look forward to uh, seeing you on the next session, which will probably be the fourth and final installment of this whole NERG test prep uh, series. And we'll talk to you soon. Have a great day and uh, take care. Bye-bye now.